Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Shelly Hauser. She has a congenital hemipelvectomy, so she will go into all of those details on what that is. And she has a passion for equality, education, and empowerment. So I'm excited to talk to Shelly today. So Shelly, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hey, Sarah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, a congenital hemipelvectomy. That is about one in eight million. And it's a quirky little type of amputation that is really quite unique, I'm finding. So a congenital hemipelvectomy means that basically I was born without my hip and my right leg. Um, my L4 and my L4 and 5 spine discs were not totally formed correctly. Uh, so I have scoliosis and lordosis in my lower spine. And um, I went to Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia for, at the time in the 70s, was for crippled children, which always made me even then cringe quite a bit because I think we were so much more than that negative stereotype label. And I'm really quite surprised that um, that they used that word at that time, but it was just, that was a common thing, but it never felt really good as a kid. And so, you know, even as a child, I didn't like that, that stigma and that label because I was more than that. And I think that's where my passion for equality and diversity and equity and inclusion and, and accessibility. So it's diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and equal equality or equity is is really the whole title. It's not just diversity and inclusion. It's so much more than that. And um, but I've I've had a great life. I mean, I I went to college and graduated in '93 from a Pennsylvania college here and met my husband there. We were friends for a couple of years and celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary and uh, going to Italy soon because of it. And we have three kids, which in and of itself was quite an anomaly because the medical field, once again, didn't really know what to do with me. I have my limitations, but I also have my specialties as well. I do wear a prosthetic leg. It wraps around my waist and I sit in it. So my right butt cheek is there. It's kind of like if you take a Barbie doll and you rip her one leg off and it's just that, that butt cheek. I mean, it's, it's a horrible visual, but I mean, it's the cleanest visual I can think of. And, and so I sit in this socket that goes around my waist. So that's proven to have its challenges with pregnancies. Uh, if the leg is about 13, 14 pounds, and it's a microprocessor, com basically a computerized knee that reads where I'm at in space 12 different ways. So if I start to fall or I'm on uneven grounding, it will lock up kind of like your ABS brakes on your car. And then when it, re when it realizes that I've stabilized my balance in space, it will release the knee. So it's very, very high tech. And the knee reads my hip socket again, several hundred thousand, like a hundred thousand times a minute. So it's really high tech. And, um, but it's actually old technology that's been around about 30 years in Europe, but I've been blessed enough to have it 10, 12 years. So it's, it's a lot safer for me. Uh, I don't fall as much. Um, but some days I pull my back out doing the dumbest of things <laughs> and, you know, like stepping out of the shower onto my, with my crutches or heck pulling my t-shirt down over my head the wrong way. And I pulled my back out because I've lost a lot of my um, stomach muscles after three C-sections with children. And so I've lost a lot of that core strength that I have to use to function. And sometimes my back muscles get a little wonky with its scoliosis intact there. And so I'm on crutches for a couple of days and I'm lighter and I'm faster. Um, but then it throws my back off. So it's with most amputees, it's six of one thing and half a dozen of the other. In some ways you're better off on your prosthetic and in some ways, you're better off on crutches. And there's no right way or better way. It's just different. Because when I'm on my crutches, 
I get almost like rug burn underneath my armpits from that constant rubbing, even though the padding is very soft and um, smooth. So, yeah, and then I overwork my shoulders and my back muscles. So it, it's a, a conundrum that we all have and we all face, but there's a beautiful community of amputees worldwide that I've been able to connect with. And they're my international family of sorts that I didn't really have growing up. So that's really good because we, we teach the new ones, the newbies, things that they should know. And they kind of teach us things that we, especially congenitally, were never taught because they just assumed we would adapt ourselves to the world around us. So in a nutshell, I mean, I ski. I did a lot of indoor rock climbing when I was younger with our kids. Um, but as my husband can attest, I am not really good at ice skating or roller skating. So <laughs> putting, <laughs> putting a prosthetic leg on wheels and ice is not <laughs> a really smart choice, at least for me. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of things I can do and that I do in life. So I'm pretty pretty active and pretty average, I would say, in the life that I have with my family. So you mentioned that you've only had this very high tech um, prosthetic for about yeah. a decade or so. So what was it like before then and growing Ooh. up? So in the 70s and the 80s, it was made of fiberglass. The, from the neon down, it was fiberglass and it just like a door hinge kind of mechanism, which really, and the hip was the same way. So it was very floppy and very unstable and unpredictable, which was not good. And then the the thigh part, where they'd always make it out of leather and they would cover what was ever in there with leather. And it looked nice for like the first two months, but then after that, it would start to get dirty and old looking and it would turn green and it would start to smell after a couple of years and you, you could wash it, but it just, it was what it was, you know? And if you were an active person, kid that was hiking and doing, going to school and going to dances and sweating in this thing, and you know, it just kind of got gross no matter how you cleaned it. So it, it wasn't pretty. Um, but <laughs> I have to tell you, we, I went to church camp one time and the foot mechanism had a rubber cover over the steel bar that was inside the foot. And there was this teenage boy who brought a suitcase full of jokes, you know, like the watering flower, like a clown would use. And, and he was annoying the, and a buzzer hand and he was annoying all of us. And I finally said to him one night during church camp, look, if I take this steak knife and drive it into my foot and not flinch, will you stop putting these jokes on all of us? And he's like, yeah, sure. And all of my church friends knew what was going on. So I took this steak knife and I slammed it into that rubber cover and I left it there throughout all of dinner. And his face was just priceless. He just, he had no clue what was going on. And I left it there and I just kept eating and he left because he, I never saw him again the rest of the week. Um, he stopped. So it has its, it has its jokes and its own benefits sometimes. So <laughs> you, you learn to have your sense of humor as a kid and you work with what you've got. So. Was it ever weird having to tell people like this, this leg isn't real? <sighs> yeah. They used to call it a wooden leg, which was like, so 60 years ago when they really were made of wood. Um, it, it, when I was growing up, it wasn't a thing to be celebrated or it wasn't cool. I had friends in high school. Don't get me wrong. We went to dances. We went to sleepovers and, uh, I had a really good core of friends, but sometimes you'd get somebody who just had a bee in their bonnet and couldn't wrap their brain around the fact that you were who you were. And so society can still be very cruel when somebody's different, whether it's a disability, mental or physical, or they're LGBTQ. Sometimes if they're a person of color, I know there's a lot of Asian hate out there. And I worry for my sister-in-law who's Asian American living in Germany. And there can be some 
you know, differences still can be a problem in society. And I, I think that's why, I, again, I'm so passionate about equality and I latch on to the other misfits of America that, that have lived through some of these stigmas and biases that I have. Um, this one young gentleman moved from Virginia to our school and he very tall, good looking young man. And he wanted to dance with me at the high school dance. And he landed up putting his arms around me and realizing that I was different. And he felt my, my space. And he literally walked off the dance floor right in the middle of the song because he couldn't handle it. And he was nice to me, but you know, it, it didn't, he didn't want to be a part of whatever that was. And um, there was a girl who was the high school bully. Well, for me, she was. And she would knock books out of my hands. And she was just rude to me. And one day, my parents owned a hardware store. And over the weekend, I was getting ready for a sale, putting up flyers and moving things around to the end caps. And, and the next day, I go to school my best friend from elementary school and her mom and my mom had worked together for years. I show up to the table where we all would eat and everybody's books and stuff were in my seat and I couldn't sit there and nobody would move their stuff. Well, Chris decided that she had a problem with me and my best friend from elementary school blamed me for calling her repeatedly. Now this is before cell phones. This is like mid eighties at best. So no cell phones, no caller ID, no nothing. And apparently I called and called and called and kept hanging up on this girl repeatedly. And I tried to explain to her, look, I was working at the hardware store with my parents. Call my mom. Like, have your mom call my mom. Like, you know me. And I lost my best friend. And later that year or the year after, this same bully, Chris, had blown her knee out playing softball and she was in a knee immobilizer. She had pulled her ACL or whatever. And we were playing floor hockey and I was taking um, the score because it was very slippery on the floor and they didn't want me breaking my prosthetic leg. Understandable. So I was in gym and Chris had to sit next to me because she was out with her disability at the time. And without looking at me, she looked straight ahead and said to me, Something along the lines of, you know, what's different between you and I? I'm like, huh, no, what? She says to me, I blew out my knee and I'm in this brace for only a few weeks. And I'm going to heal and I'm going to get up and I'm going to go do floor hockey and uh, softball and lacrosse. And I'm going to be back to normal. And all you're going to be is a cripple the rest of your life. Cool. Like that was how people saw me. And uh, I tried to call her ooh, about 10 years ago for our 20th class reunion from high school. And she, in no uncertain terms, left me know that she did not want to hear from me at all. So in my opinion, whatever her problem was, was still her problem. And um, she was a very angry individual that needed to get her act together because whatever her problem was, wasn't about me. I was fine with the life choices that she made and the partner that she chose and, and her life that she created for herself. But, you know, you're not going to make everybody understand and you're not going to make everybody accept you. But there's a lot to unpack and learn, especially when you're born different and unique. So there's a lot of good things about my life and a lot of things I'm extremely proud of that I've broken a lot of molds and stigmas and biases about persons with disabilities, especially a congenital disability. But it teaches you something. It teaches you to find your skin. It teaches you to find your sense of humor when you have a disability. And it either makes or breaks you. And working for my prosthetic company for a couple of years I'd see, I'd see both sides of somebody going to step out into the world on two legs and they'll be fine. And others, they're so overwhelmed and they're so freaked out visually, emotionally, and physically 
by the drastic change, the sudden change, that they they don't make it. You know, they don't thrive like they can or they should. So it's um, it's a challenge, but we try as a virtual family to support each other and have those hard conversations, those difficult, uncomfortable conversations, whether we're men or women. And I think it helps the newbies, you know, new amputees, to realize they're not alone. Even if they never post anything on a Facebook page or a private chat page, at least they understand that they're not the only ones. And some of us have been doing it a lot longer than them. And they're going to be okay. So you mentioned that your disability is extremely rare. Mm -hmm. Have you found other people with it through your international community? Hmm. Only one congenital hemipelvectomy. Uh, there is a Facebook page of women, high-level amputee pages with J Damien Harper out of the UK. He's a, he's a hemipelvectomy or a hip dysartic with a bikini socket, which is a much smaller socket than mine. Uh, and he's out of the UK and he'll do chats. And Hannah out of the UK has a women-only high amputee webpage for hips and hemis. Uh, she unfortunately was crossing the street in Canada and was hit by three vehicles. And she's a below the knee on one side and a hemi or a hip amputee on the other side. And I don't know what, what happened, but that was a tragedy for her. But she's getting along well. She has both prosthetics and she's, she's living life and moving on. So I should explain what a difference is between a hip and a hemi or HD. Uh, hemipelvectomy is when you have absolutely no bone structure where your hip should be at all. And a hip disarticulate or HD is more like you have the top crest of your hip structure. So you have some sort of stability in there, which does help with your balance. Like when you're sitting or when they fit you for your prosthetic, it's, it's more solidity for that, um, brace socket to latch onto because there's there's bone there not just muscle or skin so an ak is an above the knee amputee and a bk is a below the knee amputee uh, and then there's partial foot and foot amputees as well and we all expel different amounts of energy so a below the knee will expel about 30 40 percent more energy just to walk uh, and above the knee will expel about 60, 70% more just to walk. And then hips and hemis are more like 90 to 100% energy just to function and walk every day. So that can be challenging. And I, and then you have to roll in, do they smoke? Do they drink? Are they obese? Do they have heart failure, lung issues like COPD? Uh, are they older and they're starting out? Because, you know, a 70-year-old amputee isn't going to be as thriving as maybe a 20 some year old amputee from the same act, the same kind of car accident or motorcycle accident or something. So they, they may not, it, just because there's other things you start to age and things you don't bounce back and you don't heal as fast as when we're younger. So were your parents prepared when uh, you were born? <laughs> Absolutely not. So this was 1970. Uh, they had had my sister, who's physically, mentally healthy. And then they lost a boy about three, four months into that second pregnancy. And they so backing it up, they got married when they were 19. Because that's what you did in the 60s. And so they're still alive. And they're still married happily. And so then they had me when I, they were 24 years old. And at the time, they had no idea that I was even going to be an amputee. There was no ultrasounds like we have now. So when I was born, the doctor, the obstetrician at the time said, well, it's a girl. And then my mother didn't see me for a few days. And at that time, the 
mommy rooms where there's a big room with all these beds around the walls and you had curtains in between. And nowadays you have maybe one roommate or your own room. So it's quiet. And all the other mommies in the room were getting their babies around the clock to feed them. And the nurses kept saying to my mom, oh, she's getting her vaccinations. Oh, she's getting a bath. Oh, she's sleeping. Oh, she's out for observation or whatever. And so finally, my mother put her foot down and said, I want to see my kid now. And they finally begrudgingly gave, brought me in. And my mother immediately unwrapped me, unswaddled me. And that's when she realized that I was not all there. <laughs> but she said I was tenacious from the start, almost like Bette Midler came out with a cigar and a bottle of champagne and said, I'm in charge. Who do I talk to? That was, <laughs> that was always the joke. And so <laughs> she says, I'm still tenacious. So she said, you were born right out of the chute like that. And she said, you needed that in life. So that was good. But they, no, they had no idea what they were in for with me. Luckily, the dentist in town where we grew up was a Shriner from Shriner's Hospital. And he came to my mom and said, hey, I'm a Shriner. I'm going to get Shelly into Shriners in Philadelphia, and they'll take care of her for 18 years, which they did beautifully. And I owe them so very, very much. They, um, they made all my prosthetics. They, every six months, I would drive two hours down and two hours back. And so I'd miss school. And they did my x-rays to watch my scoliosis. They made all my prosthetics for free. Um, they decided to shave a bone off my shin and block my outer ankle bone to make it more supportive because I would hop a lot as a kid, you know, like when I was skiing and I had to go get something or I was chasing my friends around the swimming pool in town. I'd hop because there was nowhere to just leave my crutches without going back to that spot or having somebody fall and trip over them. So I would just leave them at my towel and just hop around everywhere. And so they, they've done a phenomenal job to take care of me and they still do wonderful work all across the country. But no, my parents by no means had no idea what they were in for. And I always kept them guessing. And <laughs> I was always very strong willed, but I think that I had to be. And they left me kind of make my own mistakes and pick myself up when I fell. And I think that's the best thing that they did for me because they left me find my own limitations and find who I was. And I think sometimes with all the bullying that I had, I wished I would have had more support in that way. But again, they, they got married right out of high school and they just didn't know. I mean, society was different. We didn't talk about bullying at that, those decades. And you know, oh, you're okay, just go outside and play kind of attitude. And I see things much differently now with diversity and inclusion. I think over the last three years since COVID has been exploded and they're, they're starting to, companies, cor corporations worldwide are starting to hire a new position for d and you know, diversity and inclusion. But I don't think corporate has gotten it yet. I mean, the ADA is 32 years this year, I think. And it was signed in 1990. Yeah, so it's 32 years. And they got a lot of things right. But they, except employment. Employment, they really didn't get right. And there's still a lot of stigmas and biases. And, and society still, still has those microaggressions towards us. And society has, like with the Academy Awards and the Oscars and, and television, they've embraced diversity in, in what makes them comfortable, in that you see more persons of color. You see way more things of LGBTQ out there. But you still do not see a lot or as much of disabilities out there. They... They're starting to talk more about mental health, which is super duper important. But physical disabilities, I mean, CODA, the film CODA with the Marley Matten and her crew finally won. But it had been over 30 years 
since Marley Matlin won an Oscar for her as an actress with deafness. 30, 30 years. I mean, that's that's way overdue. And then the Oscars the year before, during COVID, the documentary Crip Camp that was produced by the Obamas was a wonderful documentary that was up for an Oscar with our matriarch of the ADA, Judy Human, and Jim Lebrec, who's a sound engineer out, I think, out West in California. And it was about them as high school or teenagers in the 70s. And they went to this camp for crippled people in New York, run by a bunch of hippies. And it was very informal, but they got to find their voice. They got to share their desires. They got to talk about sex and who they wanted to be and what they wanted their lives to be independently. Because at that time, institutionalization was still extremely common. And accessibility wasn't a thing, physical accessibility. You know, there were no automated doors. There were no ramps. And so this is what Judy, and even as a teenager, you see this documentary and you see her finding her voice and how strong she was as a young woman then. And she's in her 60s now living with her husband in New York, uh, still uses her wheelchair with polio. And it's just wonderful to see how we've changed. But I think we we still have some work to do. And society really needs to find more of a social model of acceptance and accessibility for every community uh, and not just the ones that make them visually or emotionally comfortable with looking at. So there's there's still some challenges that our community faces. And what do you think? So you mentioned like employment was a big thing that the ADA kind of still needed to work on. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of those action points that should be taken? That's a great question. So every company at under an ad will put the equal opportunity statement because they have to. And it's the political, I think they almost have to legally. But what they don't get right is by law, that means that if a person with deafness or blindness or a wheelchair user comes in as a candidate and asks for accommodations, say, is the building accessible for me to get into? Or is there a flight of steps I need to get into first? Or I need an interpreter because I have deafness. Or I need a guide to get me to your office and I'll have somebody drive me and they'll be escorting me to the interview. And by law, they need to hire a, a deafness interpreter, an a American Sign Language interpreter for that interview. And I can tell you, out of the diverse group of friends and family that I have, it just doesn't happen. And the minute an employer sees, even if they're walking with a cane, not even a walker, but just a cane, because you have chronic back issues. I, I had a coworker that threw his back out. He fell off a building as a contractor and basically shattered his spine. And he was still healing, but he had 25 years of knowledge up in his head. And he was coming in to do home modifications and hire contractors to do the work for persons with disabilities. So he had 25 years of experience, but he just couldn't physically do the work. And he told me one day that he showed up with a cane and right away they were like, oh, you know what? We just, we, we meant to call you, but we just filled that position yesterday. We're so sorry you showed up. And they wouldn't even interview him. So then he landed up working for our company, for our Center for Independent Living. And he was brilliant at what he did. So employers are still under the stigma and bias that a couple of things. It's going to take too much time to train this person. They're going to ask for expensive accommodations and we're not going to be able to afford them. They're going to always be off of work because they're always going to be constantly sick for a doctor's appointment. And so on and so forth. And these are just excuses. But these are the things that they come up with. This is the feedback that I've heard over the years. And it's just, it's just excuses in fear. 
that they don't want to try. They don't want to be bothered. And honestly, I've worked since the age of 13. And I don't think I've ever asked for a reasonable accommodation. Now, twice I've had to go to my prosthetist, my leg maker, and get a new limb made. But I'd end up taking off two days and working in between my leg fitting, you know, while the glue was drying or while they were casting me. And I'd work around that. And then I'd work a little later into the evening. And yeah, that's a reasonable accommodation, but I still put in as much time or more than if I had been in the office. And what I was doing was 90% remote anyway, even prior to COVID. So employers just really are hiding and they say they, they make any, you know, any equality. Um, but I really just don't see that they do and they need to get it together. They've had 30 years under the ADA to get it right. Hopefully that's something that as life goes on, things do get better. You know, they've had the time and, um, it's my understanding that remote work has helped a lot of people in terms of needing or asking for accommodations. Yeah. I'm hoping that COVID um, has taught employers that it can be done. I mean, heck, the statewide company I work for now is a managed care company. And 90% of my time is either me going out on my schedule to visit senior citizens or I'm at home making phone calls, having interviews, having meetings, um, putting in my data entry on the notes about the people that I see. And it can be done and you can thrive. So, and it saves them on electricity, on water. It saves on the person's vehicles, being late for work. And if you're having a bad physical day, I mean, heck, I can just throw my prosthetic in the closet and still get all of my work done versus showing up while my crutches are taking a bad work day off. So it absolutely can do. And, and now more than ever since COVID, there's just absolutely no reason that employers can't have that as a, a reasonable accommodation as an option for work. So what is it that you try to do to help empower others uh, with accessibility and inclusion? So that's a twofold question. Since I left my last job, I was able to, since it wasn't uh, no longer a conflict of interest, I was able to start a consulting company called Inclusive Consulting. And I have trained the local city police force for two weeks on disability awareness and not just on amputees, but on persons with blindness, persons with deafness, um, persons with autism, nonverbal and verbal, of what they need to look for, what kind of proper first person language they need to use, and how to approach a person with like blindness. Don't just say, or with mental health, and don't just say, there's a fire, there's a gas leak, you have to get out now. A person with mental health and wellness may absolutely dig their heels in and freeze and panic. A person that's nonverbal or on the autism spectrum may need time to process what that means. Um, a person with blindness, they can't just be dragged out of the building. They need to know where their service animal is or their cane or where they're headed so they know where their surroundings are so they don't feel unsafe and panic. And so emergency responders really need to take a step back and and acknowledge this and work on them, themselves. So we worked with that together. We did a little bit of role playing. We did a little bit of language practice. And so I'm empowering first responders. Uh, I've also worked with Villanova University for the last eight years doing medical simulation where they're little role playing scenes with the nursing students. And I go in and I'm an amputee with congestive heart failure or COPD where my lungs are collapsing on themselves or uh, I've torn my rotator cuff or pregnancy. We, we wrote that scenario, the first one in the country. And so I'm empowering those students and staff at the university to find their language, find their comfort level of, of how to work with a, a new mommy or a patient with a disability. And we talk about that in the pre-brief and the debrief, you know, the before and the after the little scenario 
So that's how I'm empowering the community to have a better understanding of what our lives are like and what we want them to know. And when I talk about it, I don't just use my amputation. Uh, last two summers ago, I had the, the honor to work with the Pennsylvania Historical Parks and Museums Association. And in our re my region here, went and visited several local historical parks and walked through with the staff doing the grant to and, and the staff at the park to talk about how they could make it more accessible. If a room was too dark, add it, add more lighting for persons with low vision. You know, maybe work with the local Boy Scouts to build some temporary ramps so wheelchair users could get in and out of some of the historical buildings a little bit better. How to move some of their displays around so people with walkers or wheelchairs could get through doorways and not bump into furniture that was 100 years old and break it. Or, or displays that were built right inside the doorway, which wasn't as accessible as it could be. So those are ways that I've been working with the community the last two, three years, four years to empower them and, and think outside the box, broader to that diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. But also with new amputees and new person, persons with new disabilities. Uh, it's part of our community on Facebook. I'm very out and proud about what I post on LinkedIn. I'm very proud about what I post on my website for inclusive consulting. I will be talking to the Susquehanna Valley Occupational Nurses Association this fall and talking about better advocacy, better language, better approaches and best practices to occupational nursing for persons with disabilities, in particular amputees. I've been part of two medical journal papers in the last 20 years, 25 years. Uh, so there have been medical journals and studies done on me through Dr. Susan Schmelzer and Dr. Linda long Belial out of UMass for mothers with disabilities and raising children with disabilities. So when I worked at the Center for Independent Living, it was really important for me to work with the youth that were there. And I did a lot of, even now I do a lot of advocacy and resources and let them know they have options. Here's what you should ask. Here's how you should ask for what you need. And, and how, and I try to teach them how to be more resourceful, whether or not they have access to the internet because some older, a lot of older folks just do not have that understanding. So it's, it's not just empowering persons with disabilities. It's also empowering and educating the able-bodied community and getting them to talk to each other. And that's really what my consulting company, like where my passion lies for my consulting company and what I really want to achieve and what I want to be my legacy. Of, that I've made that little bit of an indelible mark to make society understand a little bit better. That's great. And outside of like the internet and your connections online, are you surrounded by mostly able-bodied people? Hmm. Yes. Now, if I hadn't worked at the Center for Independent Living, I wouldn't have the disabled, diverse friends that I have. But we've all kind of scattered. I, I, some of them have MS. Some have muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, stroke. They're on the spectrum, which the spectrum now is what they used to call Asperger's, ADHD, ADD, autism, Down syndrome, lower IQ individuals, and... So we we connect mostly virtually, but we do get together. In fact, that was part of the brunch we just had to this morning. <laughs> um, so we it, it's important to keep that family, whether we're in person or virtually. But I just kind of grew up being that loner and and not having that family. 
once a year when I was in high school, my parents sent me to learn to ski. So I ski on one leg with two outrigger crutches, um, cuff crutches that go around the elbow, and then they'd have a little piece of ski on the bottom of them. And so I learned at 13, and I, I still, we didn't have enough snow this year, but I still ski. And that was the only time growing up that I could be around my peeps, other kids with physical disabilities. And I lived for 51 weeks out of a year to be there that 52nd week of the, you know, of the year and be around that. And, and being in that environment of persons with working with persons with other disabilities, even though they weren't the same as mine, it, it in the beginning felt really bizarre that, and I always called it our little village of misfit toys because we all had some quirky little anomaly and some had a better strength than mine. And in some ways I had a better strength than theirs. And, but we all worked together and we all fit and it was wonderful to have that. You know, if I showed up with my, my leg one day because my back was bothering me, it didn't matter. If somebody got a new wheelchair, we were like, Ooh, what does it do? Let me see all the bells and whistles on it. Oh, it lights up. Oh, you can raise it. So you're at my eye level and now you're taller than me. And so, but we need that. We need to see representation. We need not just amongst ourselves, but in society in general, we need representation. We need to see people on television, people on billboards, people writing books and doing commercials and we need to see that every day, whether it's our own in particular disability or not. It's representation really matters and we matter. Now, you mentioned also that you are going to Italy to celebrate your anniversary with your husband. Will flying be difficult? And like, are, have you ever been to Italy so that like, you know what to expect? So, yes, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary, a little late because of COVID. Thanks very much. But <laughs> flying can be a challenge. And a lot of newbies, new amputees, persons with new disabilities ask that question of what am I going to get myself into? <sighs> Since 9-11, we get screened differently. Most TSA agents have gotten it together. Uh, only one time with a newborn and a spazzy five and seven year old <laughs> going to a Disney cruise, uh, they literally separated me from my family. My husband had all of our stuff and three kids and they, they made me take my prosthetic off and they put me in a isolated box and kept me there for 15, 20 minutes and wouldn't answer any of my questions. Even though I was completely upfront with the fact that I had a prosthetic leg, what it was going to look like, how they were going to scan it. And they couldn't have been more rude and invasive and disrespectful ever. And when I find, I couldn't even peek my head out and say, honey, don't forget my purse. Don't forget the tickets. They shoved the door closed. And when I got my leg back, they got quite an earful. And I told them, I am not going to be late for this cruise with three children. And I, I'm like, you are going to go get me one of those little carts, those little trolley shuttles. And you're going to get my butt to the gate on time because otherwise I'm going to sue you. And I was livid. Um, so you have that round glass thing that x-rays you basically. And I walk through, but prior to that, I either wear shorts or a skirt or something, or I pat my hip and I kind of pull my pants legs up and I am completely forthright and showing them. And I, before I step into that, I said, okay, this is, you're going to see this and it's going to all be metal. It's going to all light up like Rome and a Roman candle. And, and I tell them, and then I step out and they get a female to pat me down and I show her, you know, this is, and I walk them through the process. I say, this goes around my waist. They usually do my waist. They do my hands, they do my knee, and then they do my foot, my prosthetic foot. And this is what it's all made of. And I educate every TSA officer as I go through the process for twofold. One for my safety and to make the process more expedient and user-friendly, but to also educate them in the community so that the next time they see an amputee at any level, they're a little kinder and a little more educated 
And a lot of them will say, nobody's ever explained that to me before. And again, society needs to hear that. They need to see it. They need to get their hands on it. And they need to understand it. So you know, I, I don't think there's any day of my life that I don't advocate and educate in some way. Um, and I just think it's super important. Now, when I go, it's going to be an eight-hour flight. I've been to Denmark, Italy, and Germany twice, Austria, Sweden, and Mexico. And, you know, and then nationally, like Florida, California, whatever. But since my socket goes around my waist, I can loosen the socket a little bit, but it rests, the edge of it rests on my rib cage. So sitting in it, it's kind of like wearing very fancy wedding shoes, very restrictive tight shoes. Usually at the end of the night, you want to take them off and just dance. Well, that's kind of what it's, what it's like wearing a prosthetic. And you just want to let your skin breathe and relax for a little while. So at night, I sewed a very tall bag and at night I'll take my leg off and I'll give it to the flight attendant and she'll put it in a closet and then use my crutches while I'm on the flight. And then in the morning, I'll get it back on and put it back on in the morning. Uh, that's what we did when I, we went to Germany a few years ago. And they're incredibly accommodating. I always make a, a note on my flight ticket prior so they know what to do. And I just, again, walk them through the process of what I need and say, how can I help you to get this done? And they'll, and we'll just talk about it in a very respectful, grown-up kind of way. And, and they figure it out. And it's gotten much better. But yeah, it can be exhausting. And I can't just pop it on and pop it off like a below-the-knee or a, an above-the-knee amputee and just tuck it underneath my seat because it's much taller. So it, it has its challenges, but they've gotten better since 9-11. And that's all I can hope for. <laughs> and that's great to hear that it has gotten better. Now, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners before we start to wrap things up? Well, I hope this, you know, my story touches somebody and lets them know that they can create whatever they want their life to be. I mean, I went to college, I got married, had three kids got my master's degree in human services since COVID. And we do things differently. We may do things a little slower, but we can get it done. Society, the world was not built for us. And whether we have a congenital disability or it's an acquired one later in life, we're problem solvers. We have to do things differently pretty much every day of our lives. And it can be done. And you can write your life however you want it to be. You may need some assistive technology. <laughs> and heck, you know, Sarah, you have assistive technology right now. You technically have a disability wearing glasses. Right? <laughs> and it yep. could be as simple as that, you know, or it could be more challenging. But it can be done. And there's so many great avenues to, I mean, heck, now we have Google. Now we have Bing. Now we have YouTube. And you can learn that way of how to get things done. And um, us, us oldies, us lifers, as I like to say, had to learn the hard way before, <laughs> before Facebook and Google and, and uh, YouTube and TikTok and all of that. And I see there's a lot of ways to celebrate our abilities. And I'm... The second half of my life is really turning out to be something really grand. And would I change it? <sighs> yes and no. I mean, I would love to know what it feels like to run because I have no concept of running. I said, so my next life, I want to come back as a runner, like an Olympian level runner that I'm just running all the time. So that, you know, things like that I miss, I wish I could do. But it's given me tenacity. It's given me a great sense of independence and resourcefulness. And I'm raising some beautiful, strong men, young men who are going to be more patient and more thoughtful as they go through their life. It, and they're completely able-bodied and they don't really have their own disabilities, but 
you know, I, I hope to make the next generation between that and teaching at Villanova with the medical students. And I, I really hope to leave a mark on them so that they go out and they ask these questions and they, they want to help and they see society differently than the way I did growing up. That's truly great. Now, at the end of every episode, I do ask a random question of all of my guests. So your question is, what is the weirdest thing in your refrigerator? And I just cleaned my refrigerator out. <laughs> Maybe what was the weirdest thing you found? The weirdest thing I found in my refrigerator? Um, well, there was a glass jar. And we think that they were pickled peppers. But we're not really, don't laugh at me, but we're not really sure what they were, but it smelled kind of bad. So we kind of got rid of them because we were afraid it was going to take over the refrigerator and maybe walk out in the middle of the night and kill us. So we just kind of, we just kind of put it down the garbage disposal. But we weren't really quite sure. It, it kind of got shoved to the back corner. And when we got the new refrigerator a couple of months ago, we just plopped everything back in because we were in a hurry. So we're not really quite sure what that mystery thing was, but it never got consumed. And I, I'm grateful because that was one less hospital bill <laughs> of emergency room visit. Um, but yeah, we kind of got a little lax during COVID and just we're trying to be on survival mode. But yeah, we always have that one weird thing in the back right corner of our refrigerator, don't we? All right, that brings this episode to a close. I'll be leaving lots of links for Shelly in the description. So she has a podcast, Life Beyond the Label. So a link for that podcast. It's also on Instagram, her Facebook and website for her inclusive consulting business, and also her LinkedIn if you would like to connect with her there. She's open to all sorts of connections or providing resources or help or anything you might be interested in. So feel free to go check out all of those great resources and links. And if you'd like to connect with the podcast here on social media, our website is in the description as well. That brings you to our Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my email is there as well if you'd like to connect directly with me or be a guest on the show. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, a link for that is in the description as well. So thank you so much, Shelly, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. It's been a joy to be on the show and um, have a great day, everybody. Bye.